Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh dearest respected viewers and welcome to Live in London Many of you have been commemorating the, the 10 days of Muharram and been commemorating the tragic death of Imam Hussein ibn Ali and his companions Many of you would have been going to Majalis listening to talks online probably getting involved with the Majalis, the setups, the organizations and also getting involved with marches and also the Azhar Insha'Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your amal and also your hajat. But does the tragedy of Karbala stop in Karbala? Does it all end? The legacy of Hussein, does it end with Imam Hussein's death? And what about those who were captured and taken captive? What happened to them? What happened to Imam Sajjad? If they were taken captive, where did they go? Who did they meet along the way? My guest with me is Sayyid Dr. Amar Nakshwani Sayyid, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. How are you? Alhamdulillah, very well, thank you, very well. Before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Sayyid for coming because he has travelled very far and has been very, very busy this Muharram. And also for the viewers, if you have any questions or if you'd like to comment on your Muharram experience on our shura, please contact us on 0203 515 and call in. Also, the WhatsApp number will be on the lower third below, and you can contact us there as well. Sayedna, how was Toronto? Yeah, alhamdulillah, Toronto was fantastic. Um, I lectured for the Afghani community. MashaAllah. And they oh, were a fantastic oh, oh. community. Although, you know, with Majalis these days, it becomes a cosmopolitan feel. Yes. With everybody coming from far and wide. But alhamdulillah, it was, it was brilliant, and I, you know, you hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts inshallah uh, our deeds uh, in this holy month yeah. so you as a, a speaker i mean you, muharram must be a very very busy time for yourself how do you actually um how do you prepare for these 10 nights how do you what do you expect and and how do you actually go about delivering a good message well expect the unexpected as i <laughs> saw this year in night six of muharram when uh, 10 minutes into my lecture on islamophobia the you know the the power just cut off wow. in the mosque. So, you know, you've prepared this lecture for a year, you're ready to give it, and then all of a sudden, you know, subhanAllah, you realize there's only one great planner, and that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the atmosphere that night in the mosque was fantastic atmosphere. I'll never forget it. Um, everybody was in unison in that period of patience where we were waiting for that electricity and so on yeah, to come sure. back. Uh, but alhamdulillah, you know, the, the people were hospitable, uh, the Canadians at large, you know, were very receptive, there was a great energy in the majalis, so alhamdulillah, it's, it's, it's a great feeling, 17th Muharram, uh, for me, 17th year I'm reciting majalis, uh, so alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a great blessing. So for you, obviously, the 10 days are the most uh, busiest days for you, but do you feel that it's just those 10 days, and then do you feel our community kind of take their foot off the pedal a little bit or 10 days of Muharram, Ashura comes, that's it, you know, until next year, see you guys later. Well, the, the Indian Pakistani community certainly don't take oh, yeah. uh, their foot off the pedal. You'll see uh -huh. that they have, uh, they have Majalis sometimes for 60, 65 days in a row, yeah. which is, you know, something very, you know, spectacular. Um, naturally, the first 10 days are going to, are going to draw the crowds because you're leading up to the 10th of Muharram, you're leading up to this monumental uh, day, but I've seen communities around the world who have, you know, speakers coming for ten nights, six, seven, you know, ten nights yeah. sessions in a row, um, and then dip from different cultures and different backgrounds. And yes, there are certain people you may see them on the tenth of Muharram and never see them again till the next tenth of Muharram. Yes. But who are we to judge? At the end of the day, we hope that this Muharram had a profound effect on them, and that hopefully in the near future they'll continue to attend the other majalis because I think. The period between Muharram, Safar, and until the holy month of Ramadan, you've still got, for example, the Shahada of Fatwa al Zahra, alayhi salam, the Wilada of Imam Ali, alayhi salam, yes. of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, the yes. Shahada of the Prophet, the Shahada of Imam al Hassan, alayhi salam. So there's still many wonderful occasions in which a person is able to recharge their batteries. Uh, mm -hmm. I say it literally because I think what people don't realize is that the wilad and the shahadas of Ahlul Bayt are opportunities for a person to be able to, Definitely. you know, spiritually grow. If you're only mm -hmm. going to turn up in Muharram and Shahar Ramadan, yeah. 
In the same way your phone battery dies and you look for a charger, uh -huh. likewise your soul's battery is going to die unless you charge it up with the remembrance of the Qur'an and the Ahlul Bayt uh -huh. yeah. Do you feel that um, during Muharram time maybe the battery gets too charged and that's why they're not coming back to, or to continue the uh, commemorations and such? No, I think I, I can appreciate that there are people out there, they've got commitments at school, commitment at yeah. work. I know people who were traveling one and a half, two hours from their university mm -hmm. to come and listen. There were families who were traveling a few hours to come and listen. Now you can only do that so much. Um, there are people who have, you know, children at home, school days and so on. Yes, so yes. you can appreciate that it, it, it can be somewhat difficult for some people. Um, but yes, you've got Imam Zain al-Abdin Shahada coming up. Yes. You've got, you know, uh, Bibi Sukaina, uh, yes, you've got, for yes. example, the Arba'in. Yes. So there's a number of occasions coming up in which a person c should try and make the most of. Coming on to that point, do you feel that because of the f following dates and occasions that are coming up, like you said, the death of say Imam Sajjad, the death of Sayyid Ruqayya, Arba'in, this is why a lot of people would continue to stay in that mourning and grieving state. Um, or do you think that, you know, you don't have to continue that state? You can, you know, uh, as if you continue with your life? Well, I think it should be a healthy balance. You know, you continue with your life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know that there are certain people who will say that things have to stop in Muharram or things have to stop in Safar or things have yeah. to change. And yes, naturally, it's a period of mourning for the Ahd al-Bayt. And Imam al radha says to his companion, Ibn Shabib, if, you know, if it's your desire to, to be with us on and the highest levels in heaven, then be happy on our days of happiness and be sad Excellent. on our days of sadness. Um, so naturally there is this, this feeling that should be there. Muharram and Safar are very sad months in the memories of Al Muhammad. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. And I think uh, people's lives should not stop, but nor should a person completely forget what's happening. You know, after the 10th of Muharram is really when Zainab's story begins and mm -hmm. really when the tragedy begins. Uh, once again, you know, and I think um, if a person reflected and knew what took place yeah. after the 10th of Muharram, they'll realize why we shouldn't stop mourning just on the 10th. Do you think that also, because I've looked at the calendar as well, and until Arba'in, there is no days of celebration. So in a way, it will set out for you to continue mourning and continue to grieve. Um, on that note as well, do you think that a lot of people um, say that we can't, you know, merry make, maybe can't go out to a restaurant to eat or watch a movie in the cinema, things you do, you know, to enjoy yourself. There's nothing, of, uh, you know, which is prohibited in these things. Mm -hmm. But once again, it's the feeling of empathy oh. and your tawalla towards Al Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you love the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him, then you're going to try your hardest to make sure that on their days of sadness, you're in a state of sadness as well. That doesn't mean that you take it out on everybody. I've seen some people, they'll tell everybody, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that. Let everybody yeah. do what they've got to do. Mm -hmm. You focus on your own relationship with Ahlul Bayt, That person who might be going out may have been you five years ago. Mm -hmm. So try and focus on your relationship with Ahlul Bayt in this period. Mm -hmm. But certainly, certainly, if you're sitting in your friend's circle, it should not be a case that Ashura finished and that's it. You don't discuss what's happening to Ahl al-Bayt, mm -hmm. We're now in the period coming up to the, the 15th, 16th, 17th of Muharram. These are harrowing times for Sayyidah Zainab salam, and the rest Indeed. of the daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So therefore we should try and reflect um, on what took place and try and mm -hmm. discuss it with our friend circle. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about the events of Karbala and talking about what happened to Abu Abdullah al Hussein. I mean, a lot of people they remember that oh, he, he died on the plains of Karbala and was beheaded, but a lot took place after that as well. I mean, could you explain um, from the moments of his, I mean, just after he was uh, beheaded, um, unfortunately, and may Allah grant him peace, what happened after that? Well, Imam al-Hussein dies an hour before Maghrib on the 10th of Muharram in the 61st year after Hijrah. What happens after that is something quite incredible, sad, disturbing, that a Muslim could reach such lows. 
Umar bin Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas was the commander of the armed forces of the opposition. The first thing he decides to do is to get 10 horse riders together. Allah Allah. And he asks the horse riders to sharpen the hooves of their horses. And then to go and dig their hooves into the body of the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. There are many Muslims out there who know that Imam al Hussein was killed, was beheaded. But they don't know that that insult that was added to injury. Where the Arabs would never ever humiliate a dead body in this way. And yet you find in the sacred month of Muharram, in the Quran we read Al Ashhar al Haram. There are four sacred months the Arabs used to not fight. Right, yeah. Muharram, Rajab, Dhul Qa'da, and Dhul Hijjah. In that sacred month, not only had they taken the sanctity of the month, but the sanctity of the body of the grandson of the man who brought them the religion. You find that Umar bin Sa'ad purposely wants to humiliate him. And so the horses begin to kick his body around the plains oh, of Karbala. Wow. One poet says in a wonderful piece of poetry, which martyr did the sun burn his body? And it was because of his light that that sun was created. Mm -hmm. Which martyr did the sun burn his body? And it was because of his light that the sun was created. In Hadith al kisa I did not create the heavens or the earth or the sun, but for these five. Ascent. Which martyr did the horses trample on his body? Those same horses used to receive their honor mm -hmm. and used to shiver when they used to hear his name. If only those horses knew, listen to how the poet now makes this wonderful. Mm -hmm. If only those horses knew, it was actually Muhammad's body they were trampling on. Because Hussein is from me, me. and I mm. am from Hussein. Rasulullah says, Hussein is from me. If only those horses knew it was whose body? Rasulullah's mm. body. Because that's the flesh of your Prophet on the ground. True. They begun to kick his body so much <sighs> that if you go to Karbala today, where Imam al Hussein is buried is about a certain number of yards from where he was beheaded. Mm -hmm. That's how much the horses kicked the body. Some of the army of Umar bin Sa'ad knew that there may have been certain things Imam al Hussein had that they wanted. For example, one of them saw the ring of Rasulullah on the finger of Imam al Hussein. So he went up to the finger of the Imam and he tried to take the ring out, couldn't, so he chopped the finger off. Allah. Others came and tried to rip the shirt which Sayyidah Zainab had given him as an amana from his mother Fatima al Zahra. Salam. You know the famous line when he came out of the tent and she started, Mahlan, Mahlan, Ya Ibn Zahra, wait, wait, O son of Zahra. And she turned around to Medina just before he died and said, Mother Fatima, this is your amana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That shirt they attacked. But then, even worse than that, <clears throat> with all of this that took place, they then ordered that the tents of the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family were to be burnt. Today, when I see the Jordanian pilot who was burnt by ISIS, you see many Muslims in the world saying, this is disgusting, this is despicable, mm -hmm. how could this happen? How about the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family? Do you know how many Muslims out there don't know the names of the granddaughters of the Prophet Muhammad? If you were to ask them, do you know Zainab and Umm Kulthum, the granddaughters? Don't tell me about daughters or... Mm. The granddaughters. Or Ruqayya, or Sukain, or, or, or... Any of the great granddaughters. Do you know any of that? Many Muslims out there don't have a clue what happened to the grandchildren of the man that in their adhan they say, Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Umar bin Sa'ad and Shimr bin Dil Jawshan ordered that the tents of the woman of Ahl al-Bayt were to be burnt. Can you imagine? Some of these ladies have lost their babies, some have lost their children, some have lost their husbands, some have lost their brothers. And now, 
The one tent that was a sanctuary for them is now burnt. And when that tent was burnt, Sayyidah Zainab السلام, the granddaughter of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, is remarkable in what really one may argue is that when Karbala ended, Zainab begun. That there's this lady, heroic, her leadership, her bravery, that when she sees these girls being trampled upon, when she sees these girls have their dresses on fire, mm. she would rather have herself burnt than these daughters of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family. And that's why you find that the narrations, what do they mention to us? Hamid ibn Muslim was one of the narrators. Mm. Yazid, while the caliph of the Islamic empire, Yazid had hired certain journalists. Amongst them was Hamid bin Muslim. These journalists, their role was to narrate what was happening in Karbala. Hamid bin Muslim narrates. He says, I saw a young girl running and her dress was on fire. So I felt sorry for her. I had some water. I came up to her. I said, here, take the water. She looked at me and she said, oh man, are you with us or are you against us? And he turned around and he said, I'm neither with you nor am I against you. And she looked at him and she said, how could you give me water? While my father, Abu Abdullah, lay there on the ground in Karbala thirsty. At that moment, she said to him, have you read the Quran? He said to her, yes. She said, you've read the ayah of Amal Yatima Fala Taqar, as for the orphan, don't hurt the orphan. He said, yes, I have. She said, Ana yatim at Abi Abdullah. I'm the orphan of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam. Then she said to him, have you read the ayah in the Quran? When someone asks you, don't reject their question. He said to her, yes, I know the ayah. She said, can you point me to the land of Najaf? Last night, my auntie Zainab told me that my grandfather's buried in that land. I want to complain to him about the way that we've been treated in this land. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, worked tirelessly to ensure that the Arabs would receive the revelation of the Lord. Fifty years after he dies, his family have their tents being burnt. One poet says, O Fatima, your house was burnt. Come and look at the houses of your daughters. One daughter running from one direction to another. Now what you also had that night is some of the mothers who've lost their children, it's a very difficult moment for them. Indeed. Amongst them was Rabab, <laughs> who had lost the six-month-old baby. Yes. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam has narrated that she, on the night of the 11th of Muharram, was looking around. She can't find Rabab. Until she looks out into the wilderness and she sees Rabab. Rabab, mm -hmm. what are you doing? She's like, I want to see my baby. I want to try and quench the thirst of my baby. Then there are the wives of some of the personalities on the, in the army of Al-Hussein, such as Daylam, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn. Daylam, the wife of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, night of the 11th of Muharram, something strikes her. Now imagine, this is all happening within the space of a few hours. Yes. You've got Imam al-Hussein's body has been trampled on. You've got mm. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, Running having around. tents yeah. trying to protect these kid children. And I remember Imam Sadiq alayhi salam remembers that one day when he had a fire in his house. He was trying to save his daughters. The next day one of his companions saw him. He's crying and crying. He said, Imam Sadiq, why are you crying so mm. much? He said, when I saw my daughters running from one side of the house to the other, escaping the fire, I remembered Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam and what mm. she went through with the children. You think that when Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam mm. was beheaded, that was it? These were the most barbaric personalities. They wanted to exterminate the Prophet Muhammad's message and family. And you find that Daylam sees her servant and she says to her servant, here's a piece of cloth. Go out into the battlefield, look for my husband Zuhair's body and cover him. It's a wife, she yearns for her husband. Mm -hmm. Within a few minutes, 
The servant comes back, she says, did you cover the body? She's like, I'm sorry, I didn't. She's like, why? I asked you to cover my husband's body. She said, as I was about to cover his body, I saw the holy body of Abu Abdullah. Allah. And I thought to myself, how can I cover Zuhair's body? And the son of Rasulullah lies there on the ground with no cover on his body. So you've got this night, which I can never ever appreciate what they've gone through. Ladies, there's no Abbas, there's no Hussein. Mm -hmm. Imam Zain al-Abideen is not feeling well. One may argue that that night, Sayyidah Zainab became an Imam for the whole of mankind. That she becomes this colossal personality, magnanimous, dignified, but brave, willing to lay her life on the line so that everybody's safe that day. So, in, in regards to the bodies that were buried uh, in um, Karbala, I mean, they were laying there. Now all of the companions now have been uh, taken as captives. How was Imam Hussein actually buried? How were all the companions? Huh? Who made their graves? Was it after? Was it soon? Sure, it's a good question. Um, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam's body lay on the ground in Karbala for a few nights with no one to bury it. Some narrations mention the presence of Bani Asad coming to Karbala to bury mm -hmm. his body. That's clear. And Imam Zain al Abideen returning back to Karbala to bury his father. Now someone may ask the question, hold on. If they leave Karbala to go to Kufa on the yeah. 11th of Muharram. Mm -hmm. How does Imam Zain al get from Kufa's prison yes. all the way back to Karbala? Karbala. Yeah. We know very well Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he wants to, there are certain of his chosen servants. He may give them the ability of Kun Fayakun because of their obedience to him. Mm -hmm. As in, in the story of Nabi Sulaiman salam, when he asks, who can bring me the Queen of yes, Sheba's, Sheba's throne yes. without there being a blinking of an eye? Mm -hmm. The jinn, one of them says, I can bring it to you. That's like me saying to you, Muhsin, mm -hmm. I've forgotten my laptop in Sydney, Australia. Could you get it to me before? Blink of an eye. Or who could get it to me as soon as possible? You'll say, listen, three, four days, working days and yeah. so on. If you look from Surah 27, verse 30 of the Quran, the jinn says to him, I'll bring it to you before you even stand up. Mm -hmm. Meaning that before you finish work, you just go work from the morning till midday, I'll bring it to you. Then, the Quran mentions someone who had some knowledge of the book, some knowledge. Said, I'll bring it to you before you blink. It was there. Now, if the successor of Nabi Sulaiman, Allah gave him the ability to get the Queen of Sheba's throne from one side of the world to another without the eye blinking, what is the issue then with an Imam like Imam Zain Abdin burying Imam Hussein or Imam al Jawad burying Imam al Rada? Yes. When Imam al Jawad was not in Mashhad when Imam mm. al Rada died. Imam Zain al Abdin, alayhi salam, is able to return back to Karbala. Bani Asad, their wives were embarrassed with them that they did not help Imam al Hussein. And so their wives said, The least you could do is go and bury Imam al Hussein. When they got to Karbala, there's a problem. There's many bodies, no heads. How do we know which body belongs to whom? Because you know what the Umayyads mm -hmm. did? Oh. They put their heads of Imam al Hussein and some of his companions on spears yes, yes. so that they could parade them in an act of barbarity. That is not surprising for someone who's the grandson of a cannibal like Hind. And so what happens is at this moment, the narrations mention that many I said are uncertain. There's a head here, there's a body over there. You pick one side of mm -hmm. it, the other falls on the ground. What do we do? And all of a sudden, from a distance, they see Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. When they see the Imam, the narrations mention that at first they're uncertain. Who is that? Maybe we're in trouble. Maybe it's Ibn Ziyad. Who could it be? Then when he approaches them, he said to them, why are you doing it? They said, well, we just came as bystanders. We're just, you know, seeing what took place. Mm -hmm. So he's like, no, tell me, why are you doing here? And they said, we've come to bury the holy body of Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam and his family and his companions. He said, so why haven't you buried the body then? They said, we don't know which body belongs to whom. There are pieces everywhere. So he says to them something interesting. He says, go and dig three different graves. 
So they go and dig three different graves. He says, as for the first grave, bury Habib ibn Madahir in that grave. If you go to Karbala today, Habib, the son of Madahir, is buried alone. Mm -hmm. He has his own dharih. As for the second grave, bury the companions of my father. They hear father. Now they're wondering, hold on a minute, who could this be? As for the third grave, bury the family of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Then when they finish burying, if you see now Shuhada mm -hmm. Karbala in one place, yes. the Sahab of Imam Hussein in one place, and Habib al Madahir has his own grave. When they finished, he then says the famous lines, now I'm going to walk towards a body which only me and unseen forces can bury. For the first time since his father was beheaded, he has to take the walk to his father's body. It's mustahab, let's say, when you bury your father's body, you turn his cheek to one side. I ask you, where was the cheek of Imam al-Hussein? Imam Zain al-Abideen walks towards the body of Imam al-Hussein and the shrides become heavier. And as he's walking, he gathers the dust of Karbala. He knows that this is a very difficult moment. I can't wish it on anyone having to walk towards their father's decapitated body. And he just falls by his father's body. And there's an unbelievable outpour of emotion. Because you know, Mam Zawadin's mom died a few days after giving birth to Imam. So his whole mm -hmm. life really was his father. And he's devastated that he's not able to help his father because of his illness. Yes. And he ends up burying his father. And then Bani Asad say to him, there's a body by the Forat. When we lift one side of the body, the other falls, falls on the ground. And when we lift one side, the other falls on the ground. He calls out, Assalamu alayka mm. ya Qamar Bani Hashim. Ya Abel Fadl al Abbas. He begins to go towards burying his uncle Abbas's body. They say that Sayyid Mahdi Bahar al Uloom was in charge of the rebuilding of the shrine of Abel Fadl a couple mm -hmm. of hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Salmani says that the builders said to me after they finished, said, Mawlana, is it true Abel Fadd was very tall? Yes. So he said, yes. I said, we're not sure. I said, why? He said, because his grave is so small. Mawlana began to cry. They said to him, why are you crying? He said, I wonder how much they chopped his body into Allah, pieces. Allah. So Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, if any of you, for example, have a loved one who's not buried on the same night as they die, don't give up on this world. For the grandson of Rasulullah himself, his body lay there on the ground. And of course, Imam Zain al-Abideen later in Sham, in his sermon, mentions these very lines. Yeah. MashaAllah, Sayyidina. In regards to the narrations, and you're saying that, oh, you know, the Imam says this and that, and this has been narrated in history, the events of Karbala, the actual battle itself, what took place after. I know you, you've mentioned already uh, that Yazid sent out narrators and journalists to take down. Uh, are these biased by any chance? Also, how do we know the authenticity of Karbala and what happened after as well? Sure, there are many people who say this. They say, how do I know that what you're saying mm -hmm. about Karbala and your majlis actually took place? For all I know that this is fabricated. Firstly, there are two Imams who survived Karbala. Imam Zain al-Abidin and Imam al-Baqir. Imam al-Baqir al al was three and a half years old yes. in Karbala. Imam Zain al-Abidin was in his mid-twenties in Karbala. And so you find that Imam Zain al-Abidin and Imam al-Baqir provide us with the narration of what took place. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Sayyidah Zainab was present at Karbala. And she lives after Karbala. And she gives majalis about Karbala. So she's able to tell us what took place. Sayyidah Um Kulthum is able to tell us what took place. Likewise, the wife of, for example, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn was at Karbala. She's able to take, tell us what took place. Likewise, you have the narrators who are present on behalf of Yazid. And you've also got five years after Karbala, Mukhtar al-Thaqafi. Mukhtar al-Thaqafi avenges Karbala. Mukhtar mm. al-Thaqafi cannot be at Karbala because he's imprisoned by Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. And Mukhtar swears that he'll get out of prison and he will avenge Umar bin Sa'ad, Shimr bin al-Jawsh and Ubaidullah bin Ziyad one by one and capture them. 
Now, when Muqtala Thakabi captures them, he's able to collect a lot of the narrations about mm. what took place in Karbala. Yes. I'm not going to say there's anyone out there who can provide you with 100% what took place in Karbala. History is his story. Mm -hmm. Ascent. History, if you break the word history, what do you get? His story. His story. There are going to be emperors who will lie. Yes. There are going to be emperors who will try and show someone in a good light and someone else Indeed. in a bad light. Yes. But it's ironic, subhanallah, that our history written in the, let's say, late Umayyad, middle Abbasid period, yet subhanallah, the maqatil of Karbala, be it Tabari, be it Ibn al-Athir, be it al-Daynawari, be it, for example, Ibn Sa'ad, be it Abu Ma so many different narrators about what took place on the 10th of Muharram. And you're able to collect all of these so that you can have a certain picture of the sacred history. Yeah. Ascent, ascent. And this history that we have, does it go on to tell us about what happened after Karbala, as in what happened after they burnt the tents, they took everyone captive, and then they began on a journey? Where would they go in? Well, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless and give him long life, long life Sheikh al Qurbasi. Sheikh al Qurbasi has done over 100 volumes on Imam al Hussein in Karbala. Um, and he's one of our teachers and one of our scholars. And he has actually mapped out what took place from Karbala to Kufa, Sham, Karbala, Medina. They leave Karbala on the 11th of Muharram. You got to remember, Umar bin Sa'ad is looking forward to a big prize. What was he promised? The land of Ray. Where's, where's Ray? Modern day Tahran, let's say, Tehran. in Iran. Okay. Now that's not a small piece of land. You know, I wouldn't yeah. mind having a land that big. and But not by killing the grandson of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. But Umar bin Sa'ad wants to get this massive reward. You know, Umar bin Sa'ad, mm -hmm. Shimr bin Al-Jawshan, Ubaidullah bin Ziyad, all of them want this reward. They want the glory, they want the victory, they want Yazid to know what they've done. They want to get out from Karbala as soon as possible. 11th of Muharram, they leave Karbala. Ah. 12th of Muharram, they get to Kufa. Ascent. The ladies of Al Muhammad are forced to ride horses with no saddles. Allah. May Allah, Allah. subhanahu wa ta'ala give us patience at this moment. It's an extremely difficult moment for them. And what's worse is having your beloved's Heads on spears. Look, you lose someone when they buried. You got some sort of solace. Yes. But to see their head on a spear right in front of you, and you're not able to do anything about it. It's probably the most devastating piece of history we have. The Umayyads had begun this act of uh, publicly parading people they've beheaded with Amr bin Hamak al khuzai when they killed him. And they continued this act. That either they'll publicly hang someone with Zayd, the son of Imam Zayn al-Abidin, later on mm -hmm. he was, you know, publicly, his body was put out there in the nude. Or they'd parade the heads. They'd want everyone to see that. Listen, any of you think of messing with our government, this will happen to you as well. And we have no limit. If we could do it to Muhammad's grandson, we have no limit to who we will do this to. So these ladies are meant to ride on horses with no saddles. These ladies have the heads of their beloved on spears. If anyone today in the world tells me it's difficult being a Muslim, believe you me, you've not seen difficulty like that journey from Karbala to Kufa to Sham. And when they bring them into Kufa, they've made this big announcement, you know, and the propaganda at that time was unreal. Especially in Sham, more so than Kufa. Kufa... People knew about what's taken place and they were in for a stern word from Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. But they were ready, they've come out and imagine these ladies who 20 years earlier their dad or their granddad was the caliph and the ruler of the whole of the Islamic empire now are paraded as prisoners in the streets of Kufa. One could argue that the Ahlul Bayt actually grew up in Kufa when uh, Imam Ali was the caliph and in his government, his capital was in Kufa. Well, I would, say, I would say the Ahl al-Bayt's main upbringing is Medina. Yes. But certainly after the age of 30, Kufa becomes a very important for Imam al-Hassan, yes. for Imam al-Hussein and for Sayyidah Zainab alayhi yes. salam. So they're paraded in the streets and the insults differ from Sham. Sham was 
this very disgraceful, low, insulting attitude. Mm -hmm. Kufa was more of a case of, well, you know, you guys look like a bunch of uh, poor people. Here's some food. Okay. Zainab, the princess, the granddaughter of the Prophet Muhammad, is now being made to feel like a homeless person, but she maintains her dignity. They throw them in these ruins in Kufa. Mm -hmm. And in these ruins, they want them to feel the darkness of the night. They want them to feel the burning sun. They want them to feel all of this. And can you imagine for young Ruqayya, only four years old, can you imagine for the wives of, for example, Imam al Hussein, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and others, how difficult it must be that you're trying to recover, but you're seeing your most beloved with their heads on spears. But the p performance of Sayyidah Zainab in Kufa, is something unreal because in the midst of the difficulties that she sees, she doesn't flinch. She could easily give up on this world. She could easily say, you know what, I'm facing too many troubles, too much troubles. On the contrary, you find that Zainab suddenly rises to the fore in her most intense moment with Ibn Ziyad. MashaAllah. And um, uh, Sayyidina, it's a quick question. How long did it take for them to travel from Karbala to Kufa, because we've done the walk and it, we know it's a long, long journey. It takes two, two, two one and a half day. days, three days, one day. One day. How fast were they traveling? Well, you got uh, you know, contrast, on horses with no saddles. Yeah, on, in contrast to us, who, for example, were thick of stopping, having a cup of tea, eating, whatever. As I said, they want the rewards. And if it means those horses are going to gallop and it's going to hurt you, so be it. They want to get there. Yep. And they get to Kufa on the 12th of uh, Muharram. And they stay in Kufa for about eight days. And as you know, at the time, the governor of Kufa is Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. Yes. In Sahih al-Bukhari, if you type Ziyad, sahihbukhari.com, just type Ziyad in the box. Z-I-Y-A-D. Okay. There's a discussion about Ibn Ziyad and Anas bin Malik. And how Ibn Ziyad would poke the lips Allah. and the eyes Allah. of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He had Imam al Hussein's head next to him. He had a stick in his hand. Sayyidah Zainab and Imam Zain al Abidin are there as prisoners, and he'd poke the lips and the eyes. At this moment, surely you'd think that would devastate Zainab. And he looks at and he says, What do you think of what happened to Karbala? In Karbala? Mm -hmm. He knows that he's hurting her. And she replies, I saw nothing but beauty. It is the most remarkable answer in the face of adversity that you will ever, ever see in your life. Tell me, you've lost Aun and Muhammad. You've lost Abbas. Mm -hmm. You lost Hussein. You lost Qasim. You lost Akbar. But what did she say? I saw nothing but beauty. beauty. Ma ra'aytu illa jamila remains one of the standout statements made by any of the members of Al Muhammad salam. Because... It teaches us that in this world where there's so many trials, tribulations and difficulties, always try and look for God's divine wisdom behind all of these tests. Some of us look at the cup half empty. She's saying, look at the cup half full. Some of us are very despondent and despairing. She's like, no, no, God's merciful. Don't worry. Ibn Ziyad's insulted her brother by poking his lips and teeth in front of her. And she says to him, Ibn Ziyad, I saw nothing but beauty. Because also at Karbala, she saw the most impeccable performance by any human being as to what it means to be God's rep on earth. Her brother was dignified. Her brother was moral. Her brother was ethical. Her brother was principled. In the face of all his trials, in the face of his thirst, in the face of seeing his children and his beloved companions killed in front of him, never does he flinch from his principles. Isn't that beautiful? Yes, definitely. So when she says, I saw nothing but beauty. beauty. Ma Jamil. I saw nothing but beauty. She's shaken Ibn Ziyad. And you know, Ibn Ziyad at one point wants to hit her. I remember the grand scholar Siba Wei. Used to live in Qom. A group of people one day came to him and they said to him, Mawlana, would you recite Masaib for us? Recite Musiba, please. Recite for us. He's like, no, there are people out there to recite better than mm -hmm. me. They're like, one, just one. One Musiba. You're a top scholar. He said, you want a Musiba? 
They think they're going to get a five minute musiba, 10 mm -hmm. minutes, 25 minutes long yeah. musiba. But it's like, I'll give you a musiba. Zainab entered the court of Ibn Ziyad. Isn't that a musiba? Just think about it. Mm -hmm. The granddaughter of the Prophet Muhammad enters the court of a man whose dad was called Ziyad, son of his dad. The family of purity has to face the family of illegitimate births. But subhanallah, her principles do not flinch. Ma ra'aytu illa jamila. I saw nothing but beauty. Hmm. She shakes him at that moment because this arrogant Ibn Ziyad is thinking, I'm going to break down this woman. Mm -hmm. She's weak. Mm -hmm. She has no voice. Voice? When she began to talk, there were people in Kufa saying, is that Ali ibn Abi Talib speaking? Wow. Her eloquence is her dad. She yes, had sir. seen her mom politically speak out with Fedak. Yes. Yes, yes, definitely. And what a khutbah the Fedakiya is. But her eloquence was her dad. Mm. And she gives a speech to the people of Kufa. Now, sometimes people say, you see Sayyidina Zainab, the way she talks about the people of Kufa, people of Kufa are the worst, people of Kufa let Imam Hussein down, people of Kufa. My dear brothers and sisters, don't generalize about a whole city. Firstly, the first people to let Imam al Hussein die and cause his death was the people of Mecca and Medina. Because they allowed Imam al Hussein to leave and didn't say anything about those who sought to assassinate him in Medina and Mecca. This is a topic that some people haven't even heard of this, they don't even know that there was assassination attempts actually in of course. Mecca while he was doing uh, They tried to season. kill Imam al Hussein salam, in Medina first, mm -hmm. then they tried to come in Mecca. And Imam did not want the sacredness of the Kaaba to be heard yes, that there's yes. someone killed by the Kaaba even though Allah says a mosquito comes on your body and Hajj, you yeah, can't kill it. Exactly, yes. The first people to let Imam al-Hussein down was Mecca and Medina. Stop blaming Kufa. Because mm -hmm. today I hear people saying the Shia killed Imam al-Hussein. Buddy, where's Mecca and Medina? Where's Ibn exactly. Abbas? Where's Abdullah bin Umar? Where's Sahel bin Sa'ad? Mm -hmm. Where's Zayd bin Arqam? Where's the Sahaba? The ones who are alive, who remain silent while the grandson of Rasulullah is about to be butchered. Where were Mecca and Medina to help the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Where were they to stand up for him? Their love of Rasulullah results in them not helping his grandson, results in them today in 2017, many of them not even knowing what happened to the granddaughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa She gives the speech to the people of Kufa. And reminds them, how could you watch this happen to Imam al Hussein? And Sukaina gives a speech in Kufa. And Imam Zain al Abidin gives a speech in Kufa. This unity of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Ahlul Bayt and the Quran is mesmerizing in Kufa. These handful of people who've been through the worst days anyone can imagine. Indeed. One gives a sermon here, when one finishes the other gives here, when one a third finishes the other gives here. It's unbelievable. Wow. And that strength was needed in Kufa because when you've got that many eyes staring at you and you've got cannibals on the other side, you need Iman at that moment. Definitely. Definitely. Doctor, we have to go for a short break at the moment, so I do apologize for that. Sure. But to the viewers, please stay in, uh, tuned with us and I will continue the discussion and the topic. If you have a question, you'd like to WhatsApp us, WhatsApp us, and then we'll be there. And also if you'd like to call in, Please call us on 0203-515-0199. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to Live in London with myself Mohsin Shah along with Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. 
So you know, we were discussing uh, the events after the death of Imam Hussein and what mm. took place. Uh, you were mentioning how uh, the tents caught fire, the, the, the Sahab were t you know, taken as captives and the, and the daughters uh, and the granddaughters of Rasulullah were taken to Kufa and entered the courts. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, a situation where we have the purest of the pure against, um, you could say, the... Yeah, the worst of the curse. worst, yep, yep. Coming into Kufa, surely there were people there who recognized the Ahlul Bayt. Surely there were people there who knew what was going on in terms of Muslim bin Aqil alayhi salam was there beforehand. Um, what was the atmosphere like for, for the Shia there? Was it quite tense? As in they couldn't, was it Taqiyah? Yeah, it's a great question. It really is. Kufa at that, at that time was, it was a, a hot spot of oppression and... Uh, a city that was in the hands of Ibn Ziyad and his henchmen, even the so-called religious of the city, let's say, in the eyes of some over there, you know, Shurayh al-Qadi amongst others, these were all in Ibn Ziyad's pocket. Mm -hmm. So if the ones who lead prayers are in your pockets, you've got nothing else left to worry about. Some of the original Shia of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam were in prison, such as Muhtar al-Thaqafi. Then you had... For example, those who had met Muslim bin Aqil but could not openly come out and support him. Such as Taw'a, the lady who meets Muslim bin Aqil when he's thirsty and sits mm -hmm. by her door. You know the yes, story. Yes. And this lady is looking for Al Muhammad. And when she's looking for Al Muhammad, she wants to go to Hamida. Or there are other names given about Muslim and Aqil's daughter. She wants to go to her and, you know, hug her to tell her yes. that, you know what, I saw what happened to your dad. There's even narrations that all of a sudden people are like, you know what, give water to these children. And one of the children hears water and says a memorable line that how could you give me water and my six-month-old baby is still thirsty. You know, lines like that break yes. your heart. Mm -hmm. But I do often wonder, that if we were in Kufa at that time, would one employ taqiyya because it's a matter of life and death? Would you come out and openly say that you love Imam al Hussein knowing that this could end up causing your death? Ibn Ziyad was on a rampage, by the way. He did not mind killing anyone who stood up against him. Wow. Now, Umar bin Sa'ad, Shimar bin al-Jawshan, their concern was that the heads reached Sham. The heads of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and others, the main person in charge of them was a man by the name of Khuli or Khuwalla. Mm -hmm. And he was in charge of these heads. And one narration mentions that he takes the heads at home that night, leaves it somewhere in the house, and his wife wakes up screaming, saying, what have you done? Wow. Have you brought some heads home? Mm -hmm. So these guys were so disgusting as human beings. That's why the Quran mentions the difference between Al-Arab and Al-Arab. Al-Arab are Arabs. Arab are these thuggish, you know, Bedouins who don't care mm -hmm. about law. They've got their own tribal ways. And, you know, you've got this guy who happily holds the head, puts it at home and goes to bed. Mm. Today, if I said to you that someone who, who killed someone, took his head, put it at home in the microwave oven and went to sleep, You'll be like, this guy needs to be incarcerated. This guy needs to be put somewhere quickly. Exactly. These were the people ruling Islam 50 years after Rasulullah died. And that's why when people say, how did Imam al Hussein save Islam? Imam al Hussein saved us from having these people in power. Ascent. He made everybody realize that, you know what? If you guys don't buckle up, mm -hmm. then you've got to say, salam al Islam. Hey. Peace be upon the religion of Islam. Islam. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his sister Sayyidah Zainab went tirelessly to struggle to ensure that such barbarians would not rule Islam. The Umayyads ruled, but now who knows where the Umayyads are? Exactly. The Abbasids ruled. Where are the, the Abbasids? Abbasids? Yet Fatima al Zahra sons, mm -hmm. wherever you go in the world, there are people who remember what they did. So Umar bin Sa'ad now decides that, you know what, we've got to get these heads Mm -hmm. as soon as possible towards Sham. Because the quicker you get them, the better. Which route did they take? Kufa 
go up to no. Mosul. Hey. Then Sinj. Sinjar. Sinjar, yeah, Sinjar. So they went to Mosul, they went Sinjar, Halab, Baalbek, then towards Damascus. Yeah. So going towards Mosul and Sinjar, what was the reception like there? I Mosul, mean, sadly, no difference to today. They were pelted uh -huh. with stones. Allah Imagine, Allah. Zainab, daughter of Ali, mm -hmm. granddaughter of Rasulullah. But put their father and the granddad aside. Let's just talk on a basic level. Mm -hmm. A woman with no help, no support, they entered Mosul, they pelted them with stones. And they pelted the head of Imam al-Hussein with stones. You know in Mosul, up until the time of Abdul Malik bin Marwan, there was a drop of blood that fell from Imam al-Hussein's head on a stone there. People would go and visit that stone. SubhanAllah, wow. that journey became a legacy for people to remember what took place. Until the Umayyad Khalifa Abdul Malik bin Marwan decided to smash the stone up. Because people were coming to visit the stone thinking, you know what, what took place here? And the more people would question, exactly. the more the Umayyads would be in trouble. Mm -hmm. In Mosul, when Ahl al-Bayt, when, you know, Aqilat al-Talibin and the Fawatim, when they all went towards Mosul, they were pelted with stones. Can you imagine Sayyidina Zainab alayhi salam has to cover these daughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. They should have been pelted with stones. Remain strong, remain strong. And then from there, from Mosul, they went towards Sinjar. And in Sinjar, one of the daughters of Imam al-Hussein dies. Say that, sorry to interrupt you there, but I believe we have a caller on the line. Sure, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Your name and where you're calling from? Hello, assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Zainab Guzar. I'm calling from London. MashaAllah. Your question, please. Yes, um, actually, I was reading Say the Mars uh, book. Uh, a few days back, um, 14 Infallibles, and in the book, uh, uh, Say the Mar, you mentioned that has, uh, Bibi Sukaina has, um, she didn't pass away during this time, she passed, she uh, lived a long life. Uh, my question is that we haven't uh, really been told about her life after Karbala. So if you could shed some light about it, um, because in the Majalis that I used to listen to in Pakistan, it was, we were told, the Bibi Sakina um, passed away um, a year after Karbala or something like that. The but um, it's yeah. completely yeah. opposite yeah. to uh, what you've told. So just about that. Thank you so much. Allah right. Hafiz. Thank you for your question. Sure. Um, I'll give you a brief glimpse of the discussion. Although on Monday's show, part yeah. two, we look at the role of, of Sukaina in Sham. And then mm -hmm. what happens after Sham Inshallah. to the lives of these ladies. But briefly, let me just say one thing. Sometimes people assume that that young girl who died in the prisons was Sukaina. Mm -hmm. You find that a number of the top scholars say that there were two daughters of Al Hussein. Yes. Sukaina was much older than Ruqayya. Mm -hmm. Now, for all we know, all of their names are Fatima. Mm -hmm. These are just titles. Exactly, exactly, yes. One is Sukaina. Or Sakina, the other is Ruqayya. Yeah. One gives you tranquility, the other gives you comfort. Oh, yes, Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, if he had a chance, he'll name all his sons Ali and all his daughters it's Fatima. Fatima. These could yes. be titles. But certainly, the one who dies in the prison in Sham, that's a three and a half year old girl. That's not Sukaina bint al Hussein. Rather, they said that that is Ruqayya, the daughter of Imam mm -hmm. al Hussein, and that Sukaina lives a longer life. In the Indo Pak community, yes. there isn't really a distinguishing of Sukaina and mm -hmm. Ruqayya. Whereas in the Iraqi community, there is a major mm -hmm. clear distinguishing between the two. And there are ulama out there who have discussed mm -hmm. Sukaina's biography, yes. which the Umayyads and Abbasids certainly tried hard to, to change, but that inshallah we'll discuss on Monday's episode. And inshallah. then they make it, uh, make it clear the difference between Ruqayya, the young girl who doesn't really know what's happening with her father, in contrast to Sukaina, who in her sermons in Kufa certainly knows what's happening. Exactly. Yep. Uh, Sayyidina, we were talking about uh, the, the travel towards Yeah, so, in, so in, Sinjar, in Sinjar, one of the daughters of Imam yes. Hussain alayhi salam dies. Hmm. And for her, the shrine becomes a famous shrine which people visit in Sinjar. Right. 
Subhanallah, even after Karbala, you have daughters of Imam al Hussein who pass away. Sinjad, this is uh, Lebanon, no? Or? No, 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 you're still talking Iraq. Okay. Um, you know, you're going towards Mosul, Sinja, you're going towards Syria, yep, uh -huh. that area, the border area, and so on. Like how you see in the ISIS war right mm -hmm. now, yes. that whole territory, your mm -hmm. Raqqas, your Mosuls, your Syria, Iraq area. And that daughter of Imam al-Hussain who dies, there's a, a maqam for her, a place uh -huh. where people are able, able to visit. Many people think Imam al-Hussain's children, only one died afterwards, they say Ruqayya in the prisons. Yes, yes. They don't realize mm -hmm. that in Sinjar, Imam had a daughter that died. Uh -huh. Then in Baalbek, mm -hmm. where until today you have some of the most wonderful lovers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. They say if you want to see a lover of Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam, meet a Baalbaki. Nobody loves Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam like the people of Baalbaq. And there is a maqam there for Sayyida Khawla, the daughter mm -hmm. of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So you've got Mosul, Sinjar, and you've also got Baalbaq, but you've also mm -hmm. got Halab. Halab. Up until recently, you know, we used to all go ziyarah to Sham. Yes. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to return soon. Inshallah. And we'd always make that four, five, six hour journey towards Raqqa and Halab. And Raqqa, we'd meet or we'd sit by the grave of Awais al Qarani, mm -hmm. Khuzayma bin Thabit al Ansari, Ammar bin Yasser. Because Raqqa is where the Battle of Safin took place. Mm -hmm. In Halab, Halab has Muslims and has Christians. Yes. And in Halab there was a Christian priest who looked at these prisoners who had come. He doesn't know Zainab, doesn't know Umm Kulthum. Mm -hmm. He sees them. And the army of Shimon bin al Joshan, they just want to get to Sham quickly. So they're like, listen, yeah. we come here for the night, we we'll sleep a bit, mm -hmm. and then we'll go. And so... He looks at the heads on the spears, but there's one head in particular that affects him. And he keeps looking at that head. He asked them, whose head is that? They said, you've got, you know, it's none of your business. Mm -hmm. It's the leader of the rebels. That's the way they described Imam al Hussein. You know what? He went to wash the face of Imam al Hussein. That face had blood all over it. Allah Akbar. That face that was kicked on the ground. That face that had an arrow straight through the forehead. And he begins to wash the face. And subhanAllah, miraculously, this is the priest narrating. He says, I said in the name of Mary and her son, tell me who you are. And he says, I heard a voice say, to, saying the verse from Surah Al-Kahf. Mm -hmm. If you think the companions of the cave and the Raqim are a sign of God, then know that I, Hussein, son of Ali, am the greatest sign of God. Mashallah. And this priest is taken aback. Mm. And he asks to be one of the prisoners going to Sham. Mm. He's that much affected by Imam wow. al Hussein. He joins the camp. He joins the camp. Wow. So in Halab until today, and certainly when we used to visit from you know the year 2006, 2007. Mm -hmm. When the Haidari Islamic Center in South London began doing ziyaras to, to, you know, mm -hmm. to Sham and then later on with spiritual journeys. Ashraf. When we went, I remember giving majalis by this very area where the head of Imam al Hussein was. Mm -hmm. And the people of Halab, be they Christian or be they Muslim, never forget this place because it's in the monastery. So you're saying that the actual location. The location is, where the head was kept. Kept the, the, the yep. priests. Owned. Yep, yep, yep. The location. Wow. That same location is still there until today. Mashallah. Sadly, with you know ISIS and uh, people like that, they sought to destroy these monasteries. Mm -hmm. But Subhanallah, a Christian is enamored by Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Mashallah. Imagine the light shining from the face of Abu Abdullah. That this Christian just looks at that face and wants to be with the companions and with the beloved ones of Zainab and those that surrounded her. MashaAllah. Doctor, if we may, can we take some questions? Sure, sure, go ahead. My phone's going all over the place. But a lot of questions asking on 
a good reference to Karbala and what's happened and what's happened after. Is there any books you could recommend, especially in the English language? Sure. Um, um, although most of the books I've read would be in Arabic, but yes. in English, there's three types of books to think about. One is the original narrative. So someone can look online if you look for the Maqtal yes. of Abu Mikhnaf. Abu Mikhnaf. M I K H N A F. PDF probably available. Yeah, quite, PDF quite online is available. I sent. The Maqtal of Abu Mikhnaf. That gives you an understanding of what took place in the journey. Ansariyan mm -hmm. Publications in Qom had a very good book released about seven, eight years ago called. The Tragic Saga of Karbala. Wow. I really enjoyed that read. It was excellent Arabic English. Mm -hmm. Then there's a third genre of books. The likes of David Pinot, Kamran Aghai, Peter Chelkowski have written excellent analysis of the impact of Karbala and Ashura today. Mm -hmm. Wow. And the impact of Sayyidah Zainab today. Mashallah. So if you look for Peter Chelkowski, David Pinault, P-I-N-A-U-L-T, mm -hmm. and Kamran Aghai. They have written brilliant works Mashallah. about Karbala and the narrative and how it works today. Mashallah. Just a quick note to the viewers. If you do have a question you'd like to send in via WhatsApp, the number should be on the screen. And if you'd like to call in and give a question direct to Sayyid Amar, please call us on 0203-515-0199. Doctor, another, uh, I don't really like this question here. And then I hope you can shed some light on it. But did the life of the Ahlul Bayt always center around the Masiba of Karbala throughout, the, uh, throughout their lives and came home as illustrated by Zakarin often or they resort to some other aspects of to propagate Islam? So um, was, was the whole of the Ahlul Bayt, did it evolve around after Karbala? Did everything else evolve oh, around Karbala? Karbala is pivotal. Karbala is pivotal. Mm -hmm. No Imam of Ahlul Bayt dies without mentioning Imam al Hussein in his final breaths. Imam al-Radha, Imam al-Hadi, Imam al sadr Secondly, every Imam of Ahlul Bayt stresses on Ziyarat al Hussein. Thirdly, every Imam of Ahlul Bayt used to ask reciters, please recite for me Masa'ib al Hussein. Because they knew Karbala, if someone reflects on that day, mm -hmm. you reflect on justice, you can see it on spoken of on that day. You Ascent. reflect on the role of woman on that day, leadership on that day, morals on that day, Ascent. humility on that day, Ascent. interfaith, intrafaith, Ascent. politics, economic, everything can be seen on that day. Ascent. But naturally, Ahl al-Bayt wants us to reflect on that day, to apply the principles, not to just simply be emotional. Ascent. I have a personal question, if I may. Sure. Is we, we've heard uh, the Imams and also the, the scholars say that we will not forget Karbala the way they forgot Ghadir. As in, they forgot of Ghadir and forgot the status of the Ahlul Bayt. Zainab was the difference. Nascent. Zainab was not at Ghadir, one may argue. MashaAllah. And, um, and she's definitely the difference. MashaAllah. Zainab is what kept Karbala alive. Question here, this is direct to you, uh, the Sayyidina. Some say that Ibn Ziyad could have killed Sayyidina Zainab, uh, salam, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected her without sounding blasphemous. Allah could have also saved Imam Hussein alayhi So what stopped Ibn Zayd from killing her while she was de derived her famous speech in the, play in the palace? I, in I the think courtyard. Ibn Ziyad realizes that everybody is looking at him mm -hmm. in shock that he's willing to kill a woman. They would have seen him as the most cowardly. As okay. he's about to hit her, he looks around and everybody is in shock. The Ibn Ziyad who dominated Kufa all of a sudden seems so small. MashaAllah. Could one also say that there was Imam Sajjad there to protect? Uh, I, th I think on the contrary, I think it's Sayyidah Zainab who jumps in. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, you know, at that moment Ibn Ziyad realized that, you know what, if I do kill her right now, these people around me may think twice about the story that's being given. MashaAllah. Another question here in regards to the route specifically. Why did they take that route? Why was there stopovers? Why didn't they go direct to Damascus? It's impossible that the human being can just go direct from Kufa to Damascus without sleeping. Mm -hmm. You know, and so they needed to sleep and it was like an it was at least at least a ten day journey. So they needed their rest on the way. They felt that the northern route would be quicker and the southern route on the way back was what they took uh, Ahlul Bayt back towards Karbala. 
Ascent. Could you say at that time it was the most feasible route? Yeah, the fastest route. Yeah. Ascent. Yep. Ascent. Another question here. I'm listening to Dr. Nakshwani. I'm eager to know why didn't uh, Mukhtar Sakafi take... Sorry, I'm getting phone calls left to right and center. Didn't uh, take uh, Imam Sajjad Islam in confidence for avenge for enemies of Islam alayhi salam. Well, I think Imam Zain al-Abidin alayhi salam's silence was approval for Muhtar al-Thaqafi. Mm -hmm. Imam Zain al-Abidin politically at that time could not come out openly and say, I'm supporting what you're doing. But later on, there is, you know, there are traditions from, you know, Imam Zain al-Abidin, Rahimallah al-Muhtar, falakad akhada bi tha'rina wa intaqama lana min aduwina. Then you have the tradition of Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, la tasubbu al-Muhtar, falakad akhada bi tha'rina wa intaqama lana min aduwina. So the Ahlul Bayt are in approval. But naturally, Muhtar al-Thaqafi is not ma'soom. There are certain differences mm -hmm. on some of the decisions for sure that's a uh, question here and I would, I would like to rephrase it for you if possible but in regards to modern day um, women's rights and maybe some some uh, feminist objections towards the religion of Islam the actions of say the Zainab do they actually clarify a woman's role and what she is allowed to do uh, in in terms of freedom of speech um, speaking out against oppression um, it, it, it mixed gathering, something like that. Your comments, please, on that, uh, Doctor. I think say that Zainab salam at one point becomes, you know, virtually the leader of the religion of Islam. Ascent. Unless people wanted to say Yazid was the leader, which I don't think any Muslim out there wants to admit that. And that really highlights to you that that wonderful position that a man or a woman can reach. Spiritually, mm -hmm. there is no difference whatsoever. Yes, some male chauvinistic, patri you know, patriarchal societies will never accept that a woman can speak so loudly against the injustices mm -hmm. of men. But I think what's so beautiful with Sayyidah Zainab is she gives you that, that, that voice that if there is a society that's so misogynistic as Yazid and Ubaidullah bin Ziyad had demonstrated um, in, in early Islam, then you know what? Don't let them speak out against them. Challenge them. Mm -hmm. Challenge them eloquently, you know, it's not just challenge them, know your Quran, also challenge them with eloquence. You know, and when you see on Monday when we discuss what happens from when they mm -hmm. enter Sham, you'll see Yazid looks at and says, you know what, you're, you're, you're Arabic, you're quite yes, eloquent. Yes, and, yes, yes. and she has that famous reply which I'll touch on on Monday, inshallah. Inshallah. So, uh, with your, in regards to your answer, um, it's more to do with the methodology um, and say the Zainab displays that. Uh, her mother went to the event of Mubahala yes. and her mother represented Islam that day. It was a mm -hmm. political event to meet the Christians of Najran. Ascent. And her mother showed her that, you know what? Mm -hmm. There is no harm. Woman being at the front line of this religion. Allah SWT has mm -hmm. not created woman as half of the man mm -hmm. where the woman is less intelligent. And, you know, people say, oh, she's created from the rib of Adam and nonsense yes. like this. No. Fatima al-Zahra salam represented the religion on the day of Mubahala spoke out against injustice with the issue of FedEx and her daughter was her reflection. I sent. I think it's going to be the last question. Uh, so if you could really go into depth. How can we use Karbala, the whole tragedy, and also uh, what took place after, the events that took place after, in uh, relation to our relationship with the Imam of our time? Because let's not forget, we do have a Ma'asum who probably, this may be a very difficult time for him, a very emotional time for him. How can we improve and use Karbala to strengthen that relationship with our Imam? Well, I think the mission of Imam al-Hussein is a humanitarian mission, not an Islamic mission. It's a mission that sought to speak up for the oppressed, speak up for the deprived, and speak up against corruption. And so his grandson, the Imam of our time, the mission is similar. Please, let's not always talk about the Imam of our time as a man who's going to come and kill people and, you know, wave the sword everywhere and destroy people. He's not. The Imam of our time is going to come as a voice for those people oppressed out there. People who are homeless, mm -hmm. people who lack water, people who face malnutrition, people who have seen corrupt governments, people who have seen despots. And so any Muslim, any Christian, anybody can join the Imam, like the way Wahab joined. Like the way Zuhair ibn al qain joined, they may not have been theologically the same as Imam al Hussein, but they were Ascent. welcome to join because they had similar goals. Ascent. And I think if we have a larger vision than the vision of some narrow minded people, Imam Mahdi is going to come, he's going to kill people, he's a Muslim. No, Imam is the Imam who's a mercy for mankind, Ascent. like his grandfather Rasulullah. 
Absolutely. Any human being out there who's facing oppression, they're all going to speak out for. Inshallah. Dr. Omar. Thank you so much. Final points, yep. if you could. Is there anything you would like the viewers to take away from tonight's discussion? Just really that, you know, for those people out there who face difficult times, some face mm -hmm. depression, some face mental health issues, try and look at what Zainab went through Asad. after Karbala. Asad. Hold on to her Asad. and you'll get through whatever struggle you're facing. Asad. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. To the viewers, I hope you enjoyed the discussion today and I hope you learned that Karbala is not just 10 days and it's not just a great battle that took place, a great tragedy, but the imtihan that took place after for those of Ali Muhammad and, and the close companions was a great, great struggle that we should all remember, honor and commemorate. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.